And uh, please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 10. Uh, our text this day, as we continue our exposition of Luke's Gospel, begins in verse 21 to 24. But I will um, go back to verse 17 to regain our context, as it's been several weeks since we've been in Luke's exposition, providentially. Uh, so we come to Luke 10, verse 17, though our sermon text properly begins in verse 21. <clears throat> Let us give our attention now to the reading of God's word, Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Let's pray for the preacher. O Lord of heaven, blessed are the things that are revealed in the word of God. And we know, Lord, that unless the Lord opens the eye and opens the ear, we will not have the blessing that our Lord pronounces. And so it is our hope that as faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God preach, that through the preaching of the word now, that thou wouldst open eyes that are shut and blind. You would open ears to hear that have never once heard the gospel, though the sound of it may have come into their ears. Would you open hearts to receive Christ? We pray then for help in the preaching of the word, that it would not be the minister preaching in his own power, but rather in the power of the Holy Spirit who reveals God to us. And so for the congregation's sake, we pray that their eyes, hearts, and ears would be open now to the preaching of the word, and that you would bless this time, that the faith of this congregation should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the believer often finds themselves thankless, discontent, and lacking in praise to God whenever they neglect to meditate on their great privilege, one that not many have in this present day, that to them, of all people, staggeringly, it was given to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That to them, God has revealed himself through his blessed and beloved Son. What a great gift that is, child of God, that not everyone possesses this greatest gift of them all. And yet we are often discontent. We are often lacking in praise because we don't reflect on such great and glorious truths as these, that God has revealed himself to you, the believer that God, who alone can reveal himself, has revealed himself to you, the believer. That God has personally, through his Son, revealed himself to you. That men did not reveal God to you, but it was God who properly revealed God to you, showing that God intends for you to know him. What a great and glorious truth that is. Last time, Jesus Christ said to those whose eyes were open to the gospel that they were not to rejoice in their labors, though they should joy in a certain sense, but that they should rejoice what? 
that their names were written in heaven. That their names were written in heaven. And so we find a similar truth continue and carry on today. That your great privilege, believer, is that if your name is written in heaven, in due time, God gives you faith to believe in his beloved son. He reveals himself to you. And for that, you are to be thankful and to rejoice. This great privilege is shown plainly in our text when Jesus Christ pronounces a benediction on you. Blessed are the eyes that see the things that you see. Blessed are your eyes who have eyes open today to know Christ. Yet we don't feel blessed at times, but this is the greatest blessing the child of God can have. Oh, to embrace such blessedness, child of God. Well, with God's help, this is what we will consider as our theme. The blessedness of being given spiritual sight. The blessedness of having been given spiritual sight. And we'll consider that under three heads on your bulletin. First is thanksgiving. Second is revelation. And third is blessedness. So our first heading is thanksgiving. Well, as we were in Luke's gospel last time, I'll give you a little bit of uh, context once again for some of you were not here and yet uh, some of us forget rather quickly last time uh, we saw the first large-scale assault on the kingdom of sin and Satan in the gospel era that Jesus Christ sends 70 gospel laborers into 35 cities two by two to assault the kingdom of sin and Satan to plunder the strong men and to uh, free souls that were bound in captivity the nations had been deceived by the evil one, as we had seen. And Christ sends gospel ministers, gospel preachers, in order to proclaim the gospel and free souls that were in the grip of Satan. And he saw Satan, as it were, fall from heaven as lightning, showing that Satan's time of deceiving the nations is over. And in the gospel era, there is great success as the church is sent to plunder the gates of hell. And what was in the heart of the Savior, we touched it briefly, but I told you that today we would come and consider it more fully. In verse 21, we find, which is the beginning of our text, that Jesus rejoiced in spirit. And you heard that this is the sole occasion in the Gospels where we see the man of sorrows rejoice. That is not to say that Jesus did not rejoice at other times, but it is very very interesting and it is very noteworthy that this is the sole occasions that he that is acquainted with grief rejoices in spirit and this precious text then is a window into the soul of the savior he rejoiced in spirit what does that mean children it means that his human soul his human soul rejoiced this christ is a man like us according to the human nature uh, except he is sinless but you think about what brings joy into the heart of the Redeemer then. You can think of all that transpired, right? Joy over men and women liberated from their thraldom to Satan. Joy that souls were translated from the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of the Son. Joy that the gospel was preached with power, that these simple men proclaimed the gospel, and through these simple men, Satan was defeated his laborers being sent into the harvest all these things should show us where christ finds joy you know this simple and plain insight ought to matter to the christian church these things ought to matter to us to see what brings joy into the heart of the redeemer such that we would see our gospel labors as a way to adore our savior and to give him through our gospel labors one of his heart's desires to see his name magnified and to see souls saved to see satan crushed under our feet as he has promised in romans chapter 16. this brings joy to the heart of the savior but most of all as we look into this prayer of the savior we see that jesus rejoiced in seeing that this was all properly what god had done god had done all this and Jesus sees that is the case. And so he rejoices. This is the work of God. Notice what he does with his joy, though. And I think this has bearing on us. Clearly has bearing on us. 
He brings his joy into prayer, doesn't he? Uh, a component of prayer, as you probably well know, is thanksgiving. Is thanksgiving. Um, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. What is our Savior teaching us? But to bring all of our joys to the Lord. To bring all of our joys to the Lord, which is something we often neglect to do. But God... If we have a righteous joy, we are to recognize that God is the source and God is the fountain of every good gift, isn't he? And so then our joy ought to redound in prayer of thanksgiving. Our Lord gives the pattern here, but the instruction is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is the will of God concerning you, child of God. In everything, give thanks, most especially our joys. But in everything, we are to give thanks for the Lord. Especially as we think of our theme, especially if we are saved. Right? How often do we thank the Lord? that to you it was granted to believe. How often do you thank him that he has saved thee? Well, not only should there be joy over that, but certainly there ought to be joy, shouldn't there, when our prayers are answered by the Lord. You know, one of the worst things that happens to us is we ask the Lord for manifold things. And where are we in prayer when he answers us? Do we find ourselves driven to him first thought, not wonderful, I got this thing, or I had this thing that I desired, but to give God the praise and the glory. Thank thee, Lord, that thou hast done this. You know, do you not think that Jesus Christ prayed for the success of his men? He absolutely did. And when God gives him success, what does he do? He rejoices and he goes to the Lord for answered prayer. Never neglect to go to the Lord when he has answered prayer. Now, one of the things I have told you that is helpful as you go into the Gospels and you record the example of our Lord is not only to see him as your pattern, but also your righteousness. If it is the will of God to give thanks in all things and you neglect to give God thanks in all things, what a glorious thing to see here, Jesus Christ giving thanks to God, isn't it? Because you say, Lord, I often neglect to give the thanks in prayer, but here is Jesus Christ, my Savior, who gives me his righteousness by being thankful to the Lord. And by that I am saved. And for that, we ought to actually praise God all the more today and to give thanks, shouldn't we, in prayer. I thank thee, Lord, that thou hast given me a praying Savior, because I don't pray. And we ought to be grateful to the Lord for this great gift. But as we notice our Lord in prayer, let me take a moment to observe how the Lord prays himself. And I think this is very helpful because here we see our Savior, God in the flesh, in the form of a servant, addressing God in prayer. And our Lord avoids two ditches that Christians often fall into in prayer in terms of how we address God. You know, one ditch is to be overly familiar with God as though he is our best chum. The other ditch is to, and so we're not reverent, uh, the other ditch is to treat God as too distant from us, too far from us, so unknowable as a distant um, and maybe benevolent ruler. So, Look at how our Lord Jesus Christ shows both warmth to God as well as reverence. How does he address him? Oh, Father. Oh, Father. He has the affection of a son to a father. He taught us to pray this way. I'll get to that in just a bit. So here we find warmth and nearness. But is that the only way in which he addresses the Lord? He, and it's quite beautiful here. He addresses God as the Lord of heaven and earth. And so you see here reverence as well that he has for the Almighty. You are a father, but it's not a flippant 
too casual address of God as Father. It is also Lord of heaven and earth. And so you find here reverence and great esteem of God the King. Learn from your Savior how to adore God when you pray. He prays with both reverence and intimacy. And you have to have both in Christian prayer. In fact, this is in one of the ways the distinguishing mark of Christian prayer. Reverence and awe, yet also uh, a kind of nearness of God as our Father adopting us into his family. In fact, for us, it is a glorious thought that our Father which art in heaven is also the Lord of heaven and earth. What a wonderful truth that is. That our Father who loves us and cares for us sends his Son into the world to die for us is also Lord over all. These things ought to drive us in prayer to esteem the Lord. And you think about the need for us to know these truths of God as Lord of heaven and earth. Was it not necessary to think of such things when we deal with powers and principalities, with indwelling sin, the world and Satan? He is a father that cares for us and a father that has power to help us. Satan falls from heaven as lightning. Why? Because Satan is not Lord of heaven and earth. But God our father is. You know, our prayers in general, even of thanksgiving, ought to go much deeper than they often are. You know, you need, as Christ knows God, you need to know God too. Notice here uh, how the Lord uses the attributes of God, and we're to do that. We are to go to the God with an understanding of who God is, especially things like his power, his wisdom, his goodness, his holiness. See what Jesus does in prayer. He thanks God for his wisdom, for it seemed good in thy sight. So he, he doesn't treat God as though he, are, he is this sort of unknowable entity, and he just sort of does things. He knows who God is, for it seemed good in thy sight. He tells God, God, thou art wise to do these things. God, thou art powerful to do these things to give success in the gospel mission. Beloved, God is not some nebulous force. God is revealed to us. We know who he is from the Holy Scripture, children, that is able to make one wise unto salvation. Can we not thank God with understanding? Can we not thank God knowing who he is? That would greatly enrich your prayers, beloved. And you wouldn't just be speaking to one who is distant, but you would know the Lord of heaven as your father. You would know his goodness. You would know his power. When providences arise, you would say it was your goodness. It was your goodwill, even hard things. You would say, thou art good and do good unto all. I know these things, that all things work for good to them that love God. Prayer then would become not a chore, but a joy if we know whom we think. And, you know, as providence and prayer mingle with knowledge of God, our prayer life deepens. So I would say to all of us, slow down in prayer. Slow down. Think on who you are addressing. Think on who this God is. Know him, admire him, adore him, and acknowledge all things come to pass by his hand. So, because prayer is hard on our fallen flesh, we are to learn how to pray. And you are to be diligent, as we learned, heard last week about diligence in the things of God. We are to be diligent in growing in prayer. Don't be satisfied with where you are at in prayer. You know, in Luke 11, our next chapter, the disciples observe the Lord praying. They come to the master. They, they see him pray as we see him pray here. And what do they ask? Lord, teach us to pray. The disciples of Christ see Christ praying and say, I would like to pray like this. Even that you can think of as a prayer to the Lord. One that he answers, what does he do? He teaches them the Lord's prayer. And so I would say, use the larger catechism on prayer. It has a wonderful exposition on the Lord's prayer. Questions 178 to 196. And never forget this truth to 
Be a student of prayer is in actuality be a student of God. To know God is to pray well. And so I, that would be my encouragement to you as we observe the, the, the Lord Jesus pray himself. Well, let us unfold more of what the Lord was thankful for in our second heading. This is where we will spend the bulk of our time. The Lord expressed thanks to the Father that he has hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. So this forms part of his prayer to the Lord. He acknowledges the wisdom of God in this matter. Now, what are these things that have been revealed unto babes and hidden from others? Well, plainly, this is the mystery of godliness. This is the gospel that has been revealed. The gospel is shown as a mystery in many places, a mystery that requires revelation of revealing. For you cannot know the gospel through nature. You cannot know how man can be reconciled to God by observing the heavens. You can know that God is powerful and almighty, which is why every society has a conception of God, though it is all off because of sin. But you cannot know how to be reconciled to God through, as Psalm 19 says, the heavens declaring the glory of God. You cannot know the gospel through nature. You only know it through revelation. Matthew 13, 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So there's a grant here. There's a granting of the mysteries of heaven given to some, the disciples of Christ, that is not given to others. What's that mystery? We've considered it not long ago, but it is perhaps expressed best in 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. What is this glorious mystery? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. This is the mystery of godliness. This is the gospel. What a mystery that is, right? Who could come up with such a thing? We're going to come up to that shortly. What a revelation it is that God has come in the flesh. God incarnated so that he may die according to the human nature. To suffer the wrath of God for sinners who had cast themselves on him. Because God loves these. Then raised again on the third day, enthroned as the God-man mediator at the right hand of God, even providentially, as we saw in Daniel chapter 7. Can nature reveal what we read in Daniel 7? No. It requires God to reveal such things to us. And Jesus plainly says that not all will have this mystery revealed. And that is God's own wisdom. That is God's own sovereignty. That God's own peculiar and particular love would be given to the objects of his saving love known as the elect of God. Now what's the character of these? Who does he reveal such things to? These Jesus calls babes. Simple ones, literally. These simple ones. You think about who these first disciples were. They were fishermen, uh, tax collectors, the off-scouring of society. Not the scribes, not the chief priests, not the philosophers of the world, the great and mighty men that men look up to, but uneducated fishermen. When God comes into the world, it is shepherds that hear the news. So we see here, it is the babes, it is the simple ones that he reveals these things to. And what I would like to also posit to you is that when he speaks of revealing these things, He's not just merely saying that these have access to the scriptures, that they have heard the gospel by the word of God only, though they have, but that God has revealed himself personally to such as these, that he has opened their eyes, that when others heard the word of God preached, they walked away from the Lord. But these ones, by a saving knowledge of Christ in the heart, in the mind, in the soul, know Jesus Christ and have had the mystery of godliness revealed unto them. You know, think about Friday when I preach and you hand out gospel tracts. If you come, 
Many are going to hear and see the gospel, but it won't be revealed to them unless they turn in faith. You see, you can know the gospel intellectually, but unless God reveals himself to you uh, by giving you faith, you don't actually know. These disciples, though, knew it by way of experience, their faith in Christ. But the wise and prudent, Jesus said, did not see what they saw, even though they may have heard the very same thing. And this, I think, before we go much further, we need to understand, lest we misunderstand, what Jesus means by the wise and the prudent here. You know, you might, children, say, I thought wisdom was a great gift from the Lord, and it absolutely is. That's not what the Lord Jesus is speaking of here. He's speaking of those who are wise in their own conceit, right? Uh, these are those who are wise in the world's eyes. Colossians 1.20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now there's much that this world calls wisdom. You may even go to a certain kind of restaurant and they might put some worldly wisdom in a fortune cookie. But that is not wisdom according to God. That wisdom is heavenly, the wisdom that comes from God, not earthy and sensual. Those who think of themselves wiser than God, those who think of themselves wise in this world, the Bible says these are fools in God's eyes. All the Pharisees at the time who thought themselves wise and the leaders of the nation spiritually, who thought themselves something, they were proven to be fools when they rejected the Lord. Also, though, you think of not just the religious men of the time, but the world's philosophers, men like Socrates and Plato. God hid his mysteries from them. God hid his mysteries from them. Or you think of the current crop of the, so, who, you know, certainly <laughs> the current crop of worldly wise are no Socrates and Plato. You think of those like Dawkins and Oprah Winfrey, of all people, who are considered the worldly wise today. Fools in God's eyes. Where does true wisdom be be uh, begin, children? God says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's Proverbs 9, verse 10. And we're going to consider that, uh, children, on the nature of education tonight. So I'll consider that with you then. But children, boys and girls, hear what the Lord says about the world's wisdom. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, 1 Corinthians 3.19. But what is it then, we have to ask, that drives worldly wisdom? Why is it that men go in the direction of worldly wisdom? Because we are often plagued and tempted by it ourselves. Why do men, when they hear what the Bible calls folly, will say something like, that is so profound, that is so wise, that is so wonderful? Because the world's wisdom is aimed in one direction, to deny God and to embrace sin. And that is why people fawn over the world's wisdom, because it gives them license to do what they want in the flesh. And that's really, at the end of the day, the story, right? It's not because they're truly smart. It's not because they're truly wise. It's so that they can do what they really want to do. Consider how James contrasts worldly wisdom from heavenly. James 3.15, this wisdom descended not from above, but is what? Earthly sensual, and here's the clincher, devilish. This is why we think about Satan having blinded the minds and the eyes of the world. And Jesus comes to plunder the strong man. The devil has blinded the world with worldly wisdom that serves his own ends. And so we have to always be clear, is the wisdom I espouse from the word of God, which is heavenly, or is it devilish? Because worldly wisdom is always in service of the devil and man's lusts. And that would be wisdom for you to embrace children at your age when you think about what people will tell you out there. You know, you dig just a little bit deeper below the surface of why men teach evolution. It is to deny a creator. <clears throat> End of story. That's it. There's no evidence for it. You know it. I know it. 
the atheist, the fool knows it. But the reason it is taught is so that we can say, ah, but in the beginning, God did not create the heavens and the earth. And if God didn't create me, then I owe nothing to God. This is the reason, beloved. Why do men teach this wisdom today? Love is love. Why do they teach that earthly wisdom? Because they lust for strange flesh. That's it. That's the reason. The world fawns over this kind of really pathetic statement, which makes absolutely no sense. Love is love. It's totally self-refuting in a lot of ways, but put that aside. It is folly in God's eyes. It is earthy, sensual, devilish. James has it right. You know, the world's wisdom, you think of this, children. Now people are afraid to even tell you what a woman is. Is this wisdom? No, this is folly. And the really beautiful part of this is the Lord is making it more and more plain that the wisdom of this world is foolishness. So you need to see that. Professing themselves to be wise, what does the Bible say? They became fools. Children, if that doesn't teach you on what worldly wisdom is, what will? But if the minds of the worldly wise are blinded, who did the Father choose to reveal the gospel to? He says, babes. Now we have to ask, why is this good in God's sight? Jesus says it is. And the answer is plain, and I will establish it, so that no man can glory in his sight. When the gospel comes through men who were, at the time, largely illiterate, who God was pleased to reveal the mystery of godliness to, you have to say this one thing. This must be the work of God. It cannot be the work of these men because they are not anything. They are not powerful. They are not wise in the world's eyes. How can such mysteries be revealed unless it was God working through them? You remember when Peter preached to the rulers, elders, and scribes of Israel, what was said, Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived what? That they were unlearned and ignorant men. What happened? They marveled. And they took knowledge of them. What? They said that this must be the tr truth. These men had been with Jesus. Who gets the glory? Jesus Christ does. God does when unlearned and ignorant men are preaching with power and boldness. We say it is Christ at work. No man will glory. It's Jesus, the wisdom of God that preached through them. Peter didn't get the glory, right? They don't look at Peter and, and, and John and say, what remarkable men these are. They go, no, they're unlearned and ignorant. They had been with Jesus. But what? If a man like Socrates had preached in Acts 4, you would have been tempted to say, this man is so wise to discover God. This man has revealed God to us, wouldn't you? Man would get the glory, and God has absolutely no interest in that. And you ought not either, because when it comes through simple, plain preaching of the word, you can say, God has done this, not men that our faith does not rest in the wisdom of men, as I often preach, uh, pray, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5. You know, 1 Corinthians 2, 1, 26 through 29 teaches, For you see your calling, brethren. Think of yourself, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to what? Confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Why are you called and not the mighty of the world ordinarily anyway? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Jesus prayed then, Thou hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Now you know why it is good. It is to the glory of God that Satan falls from heaven as lightning through unlearned and ignorant men. And so God gets the glory when Satan is confounded.
So where is your wisdom found, child of God? Or friend outside of Christ, where is wisdom found? Maybe the Lord is opening your eyes today if you are not in Christ to true wisdom. Where will you find wisdom that will open the eyes of the unlearned? And the Bible says it is the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.15, listen to this well, that the Holy Scriptures are able to make thee, what? Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That is where your wisdom is found. You want to be wise today? Take up the book and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only book of wisdom. This is the book of wisdom. You learn of Christ and you find salvation in him, friend. That is where true wisdom is because it will bring you to God through Jesus Christ. All wisdom is folly unless your wisdom teaches you that there is no way to God but through Christ and that he is the way and the truth and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him. That is true wisdom. Now, here, Jesus also teaches one of the most glorious truths concerning divine revelation. Now, it is so deep and so profound that none of the world's philosophers have attained to it. Verses 22 and 23. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. In short and in sum, Jesus Christ says that he is the revelation of God. He is the revelation of God, and that no one can know God unless the Son of God reveals him to them. But why can the Son of God reveal God? This is quite profound, and it has been touched on throughout our time together, that the reason that the Son of God can reveal God is because he is God. That is why he can reveal God to us, because he himself is God, the second person of the Trinity. And this is a plain truth of the scripture. He who reveals God to us must be God. That's what the scripture teaches, that there is only one who can reveal God to us, and that one must be God himself. Why is that? What is God? Who is God? God is infinite, eternal, immense, thrice holy, a pure spirit, transcendent, uncreated. It makes total sense that the only one that can reveal God is God. That is why Plato and Socrates cannot reveal God to us, because they are not God. Only God can reveal God as he is and communicate the fullness of who he is to us. So our text is yet another proof that we have discovered that the Son of God is God, yet distinguished from God the Father. These are two of the three persons of the Godhead we find in our text. Yet if Christ is God, what do you make of verse 22 when he says, All things are delivered to me of my Father? Now, this reflects what we will read in Matthew 28, that uh, all authority has been delivered to Christ, also that all wisdom and knowledge is delivered to him by the Father. Now, does this mean, then, that the Son of God did not have these things? No. As God, he has all these things. Absolutely. Because the Son is not less than the Father. Our children memorize this and recite this. All three persons are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And I hope, children, you remember that. That is a vital truth, often lost today. Many Christian ministers are teaching contrary to that, a kind of social Trinitarianism, where the Son of God is subordinate to the Father eternally. But there is no difference in the Godhead, because God is simple, as we confess, as the Christian church, and there is no distinction between their power, glory, the same in substance. So why did Christ speak this way? On the surface may not make much sense to us. You know, many times I think Christians, we know that Jesus is God, but are confounded by what seem to be limitations that he has, particularly in areas of knowledge. And you ask, how can that be if he is God? Well, I think for your help, Augustine had always a wonderful rubric by which to understand the way the Bible teaches of Christ. Um, in every text, he says, consider whether uh, the text speaks of Jesus in the form of God 
or whether it speaks of Jesus in the form of a servant. And that is very helpful as a rubric. Now, that's not novel. That comes from Philippians 2, 6, and 7. Who being in the form of God, so there's the form of God part, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So there's the equality. But this, the Son of God, in verse 7, we, we read, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So there's the form of a servant in the incarnation. So you have the form of God, equal to God, no subordination there, but in the form of the servant, as our mediator, as the God-man. He is, in some sense, you may want to say, as a servant, he has limitations on his human nature. That according to the human nature, uh, a man cannot know all things, of course. And he's just like us in every way but sin. And so the scripture, when it speaks of Christ in the form of a servant, speaks of him as God-man, mediator. So for instance, children, when the scripture says Christ is the one by whom the worlds were made, that you say, ah, that is Christ in the form of God. But when Christ says, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father, in Mark 13, you say, ah, that is Christ in the form of a servant. And you understand then how the scripture speaks of our Lord. And that's a helpful way to interpret the scripture. So children, boys and girls, when Jesus speaks that all things are delivered unto him by his Father, was he speaking in the form of God or the form of a servant? the form of a servant, wasn't he? As the servant of God. He speaks according to the human nature. You know, what is remarkable about that is then as our mediator, as the God-man, God has deposited to Jesus the trust of all things. And that is remarkable because in this way, we have one who has our nature and sympathizes with us. And all things are entrusted to this one, Jesus Christ, by God. Rabbi Duncan said with awe once, the dust of the earth is on the throne of the majesty on high. You saw that in Daniel 7, that the dust of the earth is now seated at God's right hand. What a remarkable thought that is for us who are creatures of the dust, that he loves us and cares for us, and God has given to this Jesus all things, and that is meant to be a matter of the greatest praise and adoration that we can give to God. Now, Jesus, after this, it's so wonderful. He reveals himself in the form of God after revealing himself in the form of a servant. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So now we see Jesus in the form of God. The Son alone can fully know the Father. Why? Why? Because the Son and Father of the same essence. They're the same essence. And so Christ speaks here in the form of God. Our mediator can reveal God because he is God. As God the Son knows God comprehensively and totally. So he can reveal, child of God, God in every possible way to us that we need him revealed. And that is the glory of Christ, our mediator, that we do not follow some worldly philosopher, but we follow God in the flesh. John 1.18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. Now, this is a wonderful text. I wish I had time to exposit it, but you think about this. Even when Christ is here on the earth, he is still in the divine nature in the bosom of the Father. And he continues to reveal God to us through that ministry. The greatest intimacy between father and son, because they cannot be divided. They are of the same substance. And because of this, child of God, glory to God, you have every confidence that if the son has revealed God to you, you know God. Because he is God. Our yearning to know God is satisfied in the son and once again, you find the Holy Trinity to be the matter of the greatest praise and adoration. And if God must reveal God and God is sovereign, we learn from Jesus why all do not know God. God chooses who to reveal God to. He to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. That is God's sovereign choice. God is pleased with a certain category of people. 
babes, his own choice for his own glory. But he also reveals himself particularly to particular men, women, and yes, children. His own wisdom, his own goodness. God reveals God to whom he will. And you are to rejoice as Jesus rejoiced in that. This is God's glory. Now, before I move on, what of the Holy Spirit, you might ask? Is he not the third person of the Trinity? Is Jesus excluding him from all of this? Absolutely not. Because all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are one God, indivisible. The ministry, though, of the Holy Spirit is magnified after Pentecost. I've spoken of this recently. And he, being God, reveals God to us today. Um, such that what is said of the Son of God here in this text is also said of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit, now, now look at that rubric that we've established, that he who reveals God must be God. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Again, children, why is it that we need the Spirit to reveal God? Because He is God. And He uses the Holy Scripture to do it. You remember in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 that all Scripture is inspired or God-breathed by the Holy Ghost using holy men of God who are moved by the Spirit, along with 2 Timothy there. So put all of this astonishing truth together, believer. I know this has been a lot. There's been a lot of theology here and doctrine. But now as we apply it particularly, think again. Ask the question, why do you believe in God? Do you know why? It is because God in his goodness and wisdom and love has revealed himself to you. He only who can reveal himself has revealed himself to you. When no one else, absolutely no one else can reveal God to you, he has chosen to reveal himself to you. And for that then you have every assurance of your salvation if you are in Christ because you know the Lord. And you can say, it was not my father, it was not my mother who revealed God to me. It was not my minister, it was not my elders who revealed God to me. And yes, God may have used all of them, but it was God ultimately who revealed God to me. And for that, I have great assurance that I know God of a truth. And not through the fallible and sinful mind of man. And so, if you know these things, you ought to be full of thanks today. And you are to say, I must praise him. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank thee that thou hast revealed thyself to me through the scripture and the Holy Spirit, that thou hast been pleased to save a babe like myself, for it seemed, what are the words, good in thy sight. What a thing to say that to God. It seemed good in thy sight to save me a sinner. How blessed I am. So take up this text with adoration and praise, believer. Now, I know time is going away quickly, so I'll try to be briefer in our final heading, which is blessedness. Verse 23, he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, blessed are the things which see the things that ye see. Now, I think this is so wonderful. The Lord has a private word with his people. He doesn't just speak to the world. He is speaking here especially and privately and the disciples of Christ have access to private discourse with their Savior, with their Lord, and they ought to actually long for these private discourses. There are many things, beloved, that the Lord Jesus has spoken to you in private through his word. Yes, it's the most glorious ministry today is found in the corporate assembly of God's people where you might hear the word preached. But when you spend time with the Lord in the secret place with just the word and prayer yourself, it is as though the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking privately to you, taking you aside and having a word. And how we ought to long for that. That he, the Lord of heaven and earth, would condescend so far to my to the place in which I am on my knees 
that he would come down that far. And yet, he is always interested in that, and yet we seldom are. And yet, what a thing it is that Christ speaks intimately. But he communicates to these unlearned men privately their great privilege that these men saw what men for millennia long to see. Prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Now, contextually, Christ has in mind the Old Testament prophets and kings. And the Bible, if it says one thing, shows that these men of old greatly longed and desired to see the day of Christ. Peter plainly says this was in the heart of the prophets. 1 Peter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And listen to this, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. I hope you're tying that to what we learned last heading. And this is astonishing, which things the angels desire to look into. Blessed are your eyes that have seen the things that the angels have longed to look into. Brethren, if the holy angels yearn and have a godly interest into the mystery of godliness, should we not? Kings like David, the prophets, even the holy angels desired the gospel of Christ. Abraham rejoiced to see Christ's day, and we who believe have seen it ourselves by faith. The eyes of our understanding, the scripture says, has been illuminated to see Christ. How can it possibly be that we do not count ourselves more blessed than King David, Elijah, Elisha, the holy angels who know no Savior? We ought to consider ourselves far more blessed. And it should greatly humble us. It should awe us that our eyes of faith have seen what the Bible calls is the desire of the nations, Jesus Christ. Yet we often take it for granted rather than blessing the Lord for what we have. Oh, each day, believer, you are to be like Simeon who counted his joy to cradle Christ in his arms as you take up the Bible and encounter Christ in it. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You have seen that if you are in Christ. And it was the desire of such godly men and women to behold the things that you know. And they blessed the Lord that they knew Christ. We've quoted Ephesians 1.18. As the eyes of their understanding had been enlightened, as they had known what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. These are glorious things. And so what does Christ do? He pronounces a benediction on their eyes. Blessed, he says, are the eyes of these disciples who have seen such things. And if you've been given eyes to see such things, let me just encourage you in this way. Don't shut them. Right? The Bible says you now walk by faith and not by sight, meaning physical sight. You walk by the eyes of your understanding and lighten to the word of God. And so you don't shut your eyes, having been enlightened, by walking in worldly wisdom, which is foolishness. But in all situations, in all scenarios, in every providence, you walk according to faith. As the men of old did in Hebrews 11, we've considered recently. Behold, even as it is in a glass darkly, the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus Christ through the Holy Scripture. Long to see Christ. Do not run and return to the world and its ways, having once been enlightened. And what of you who do not believe? Perhaps all this talk of the privilege of having eyes to see Christ has made you think that having not seen him yet, that your eyes will always be shut to him and that there is no hope. You know, I might as well just slumber through the sermon as the pastor is preaching because evidently this is just for those 
whose eyes have been opened to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to shut my ears more actively to whatever is being said. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, friend. Because many of us will testify at one point until the Lord opened our eyes to give us sight. Our eyes were shut. And he opens it, especially through the preaching of the word. And I thought it was really remarkable that the parallel text to this, as you might know, is found in Matthew 11. And after he pronounces this, Luke doesn't record this here in his account, but after he pronounces the blessedness of seeing these things, he casts wide open the door of salvation to all who would hear him. In those immortal and memorable words, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, beloved, in the preaching of the gospel, the net is cast open. All of you may come to the Lord. Even though he says that he will open the eyes, he is pleased to use the preaching of the word to open the eyes of the blind. It is through the word of God that our minds are illuminated. So come to the Savior. He has said, come. This is his commandment, come. And he will give you rest. No one can give you rest for your weary soul. Nobody can take away your sin. Only Christ can. Even as we prayed before the, the, um, the sermon, but in the opening prayer rather, and we prayed that uh, God forgive us. That God doesn't hold those guiltless who take his name in vain. We remember that in Christ, all of our guilt is taken away. He has given us rest for our weary soul. And if you have come today, and we'll close on this, this solitary thought. If you have come to the Lord for salvation, remember in view of this text what he told Peter. Blessed art thou. Listen to this, believer. Blessed art thou, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. This is your blessing. God has made God known to you. So all of you who know Jesus, may you never take it for granted. He has blessed you. Your job is to bless him in return. And remember, actually, that salvation is not your greatest privilege, but that you know God is. That you know God, that is your great privilege. Never forget it. And how profound our joy and thanksgiving ought to be. Well, may God bless our understanding of such things. Let us arise for prayer, if able. We thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Lord, remove from us the tendency and temptation to be worldly wise. Instead, Lord, cast, help us to cast ourselves upon the wisdom which is from above, not the wisdom that is devilish. And we pray for those who have not had their eyes opened yet and their ears stopped, that they would know today the Lord Jesus that they, hearing the invitation of the Lord to come unto him, would come and would place their faith in him. And for those of us who have, O oh Lord, may we go home rejoicing with great joy that God has revealed himself to us because he blessedly has found it good in his sight to do so. May the God of heaven be praised and blessed by us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us